This is chapter 12, part 2. We're still talking about interpersonal power and influence. This section is over the power that we face in uh, relationships from person to person or that people carry with them and then the power that we communicate through our messages. In relationships, uh, power comes from different places. And we'll kind of find that all the way through this lecture. Power comes from different places. The first type of power within a relationship is what's called referent power. Referent power is uh, where we wish to be like someone else or someone wishes to be like us and it gives us the power. Uh, this can be attractiveness or prestige that it's based on or it could be uh, some form of other respect but in some way they want to be like us and thus they give us referent power. The second one is legitimate power. This is where others believe you have the right by virtue of position to influence or control their behavior. We see this in situations like parents with children. There's an expectation that the parent has a certain amount of power over the children. Uh, there's an expectation that a teacher has some form of power over the student. It's what's called legitimate power. The third one is expert power, where others see you as having expertise or knowledge uh, that they do not. Usually this is going to be subject specific. And uh, whenever you're seen as the expert and you have nothing to gain from a certain scenario, it gives you even more power. So someone comes to you for expert advice, but you have no uh, no preference on how the situation plays out, you will give unbiased advice that you are the resident expert. This is why you'll see a lot of experts used in uh, courts of law that have nothing to do with a case. They're there to give their unbiased but expert advice, and their power, expert power, is what's supposed to influence the jury. Then you have information or persuasion power, I find it interesting that they combined these two within the text because uh, they can stand on their own. Information power is having specific information that doesn't come from expertise but comes from experience or comes from just being in the right place and receiving that knowledge. Whereas persuasion power is about having the ability to communicate logically and persuasively. If people know that you're a persuasive person, uh, that's going to give you some power over them. They're not even going to question the fact that you can argue well. And we have reward power, the ability to reward people either materially or uh, relationally. And in a place of business, this may come from your position or your title. Same thing goes with coercive power. This is the ability to get people to do what you want them to do by administering punishment or removing rewards. So oftentimes the people that have reward power will also have coercive power. Now the last one here is negative power. Negative power occurs whenever you fail to gain compliance using some other method of power. So it's when the rebellious teenager doesn't buy into the legitimate power of the parent. That would be considered negative power. Next we have the power in the person. Uh, and four terms here. First one is credibility, and this is the degree to which other people regard you as believable. And influential. So that believability may come from any number of places, uh, but basically they see you as being a confident and competent individual. But that leads us right into the second one, which is just con competence in itself. So power may come from your competence, the fact that you have subject knowledge and expertise. So this is kind of a combination of a couple of those types of power we talked about a moment ago. 
expert power and information power. These build into competence. The third one is character. This has to do with moral virtue, honesty, and trustworthiness. If people see you as being an honest, trustworthy person, they're more likely to follow you, to believe you. This is why uh, so much of the time in politics, opposing sides try to make the other side look bad, make them look as if they have uh, a poor moral character, they have very low virtue. This is a, a way to diminish their power in a political race. And then we have charisma. Charisma has to do with your personality, how much uh, magnetism you have, how dynamic you are. We tend to want to follow people who are charismatic, who have a lot of energy about them. And those who lack charisma oftentimes will lack power. The messages that we communicate verbally also indicate power. <clears throat> we have things like making a direct request. Um, this is a very common strategy. Instead of being indirect about what you want from somebody, you just directly ask them uh, to do it for you. Would you mind getting me a refill? Would you, uh, would you please go do this? And... and You'll note that both of those sound like requests. They sound like you're asking for something, and you are. It's a direct request. In many cases, you might have the power to order someone to do something, but it's oftentimes going to bring a more positive result if you put it in the form of a request instead of um, a demand. Another type of power might come from bargaining or promising. Agreeing to do something if the other person does something uh, for you as well. Ingratiation, that's not a word we use often. Uh, if we ingratiate ourselves to someone, this means that uh, we get into their good graces. We make them feel good about themselves, and then that makes them feel good about us because we made them feel good about themselves. So it requires you to act very kindly. And then we have manipulation. This is where someone makes another person feel guilty or jealous enough to give them what they want. And then lastly here we have threatening involves warning the other person that unpleasant things will happen if they, you don't get what you want. Now these last two, manipulation and threatening, they are powerful messages. However, they are the ones that we should use the least often because they are somewhat negative. Uh, the first three are much more socially acceptable uh, and more likely to get what we want out of a relationship in the long term. <clears throat> On the other side of things, we have weak verbal messages. Things like hesitations, which make you sound unprepared or uncertain. This is when we hem and ha, we say um, er, uh, those things that make us sound less sure of ourselves. We might overuse intensifiers, which makes everything sound the same and doesn't allow you to intensify which should be emphasized. Then we have disqualifiers, which signal a lack of competence and a feeling of uncertainty. Here you might say, well, I didn't read the whole article, but, or I haven't seen that movie, but here's what I've heard. That first part of the statement, I haven't seen that movie, I haven't read the article, it disqualifies you from being credible to talk about the subject which diminishes your power. We also have tag questions, asking another person uh, to agree uh, with us at the 
end of our statement, uh, and this signals that we may be unsure of ourselves. It was a good movie, don't you think? That don't you think requires someone to agree with you, thus um, diminishing your power. And we have self-critical statements signaling a lack of confidence and uh, it may reveal your own inadequacies to other people. And then lastly here we have slang and vul vulgar expressions which signal a low social class and little power. Then we have nonverbal messages <clears throat> and how these can be impactful on our power. Um, some of the things that we might do is whenever we see someone make an expression toward us, we can return that same expression or a complimentary one. Avoid adapters, which are, if you remember back to when we talked about nonverbals, this is going to be things like scratching your head, <clears throat> uh, might signal weakness or confusion. We want to send consistent messages, making sure that our verbal and nonverbal messages don't contradict each other, but they, they back each other up. They're consistent. We want to remain comfortable and mobile, so even if you're seated, you want to make sure that the chair that you're in is one you can easily get in and out of without having to uh, really pull yourself out of the chair or climb out of it, um, because that indicates a weak physical frame. Another function of power in nonverbal messages is touch. Uh, the ability to touch another person and be comfortable with that and as the book implies, generally speaking, the upper arm is a safe place to touch someone, a socially acceptable place. <clears throat> and then strong handshakes are also somewhat important. If you've ever shaken hands with someone who has a weak handshake, it's an unpleasant experience to say the least, but it definitely indicates a lack of confidence. We want to dress conservatively. As well, in a business scenario, this would be um, the equivalent of a, a black suit, a neutral colored shirt, and a tie to go along with it, or whatever equivalent is somewhere along in there. Um, business conservative is seen as uh, being more powerful than cutting edge fashion. Cutting edge fashion is trendy. It means that you uh, you go with whatever other people tell you to do. And that's not always going to indicate the greatest power. We want to use appropriate gestures and facial expressions. And appropriate gestures and facial expressions may vary depending on where you are. But they help you to express your concern for others, uh, as well as your comfort in a situation or if you're uncomfortable we express how uncomfortable we are, it shows less powerful because discomfort shows a lack of control. We want to walk slowly and deliberately. If we look like we're in a hurry, it looks like we report to someone else, which diminishes our nonverbal power. We want to maintain eye contact. But when we maintain eye contact, that doesn't mean that you want to stare at people. It means that you want to maintain those uh, social protocols of of making eye contact with someone while they're speaking to you um, or while you're speaking to them, maintaining interest. And then watch your distance. Of course, today, uh, distance may be a little bit different, but uh, you want to be close to the people that you're talking to within reason. You don't want to be too close because too close can signal aggression. You don't want to be too far away because it can signal a disinterest or fear. So you want to find the appropriate distance to carry on that conversation. <clears throat> and then we move on to uh, com what are called compliance gaining strategies. 
and you can see all of these here, but these uh, these terms, well, reciprocation is if you can show that you did something, excuse me, did someone else a similar favor, it'll be easier for them to do that favor for you now. So this for that. I did this for you, you can do it for me. Uh, and there's commitment. Get people to, if you can get people to initially commit, they're more likely to make subsequent commitments. You can make uh, appeals to authority. If others can see you as authoritative, then you're closer to getting their compliance on other things. Social validation is when we can make someone believe that other people are doing the same thing. And it's a socially acceptable thing to do. Scarcity is when we make people believe that there's only a few, uh, let's say you're selling a product, there's only a few of these products left and you want to be one of the people that has it. Make them feel like there's a, there's a limited supply. And then you have liking. If you can make yourself more likable, you'll find that it's easier to gain compliance from others. If you're cold and unfeeling, or if you're rude, people aren't going to want to do what you want what you want them to do. And then we have listening. Uh, as much as we might think the opposite, listening actually builds power. If people can tell that we care, that we listen to their requests, we consider their requests, we are more likely to gain power over that person than if we just dismiss them. And here on our last slide, we have some, some comments about resisting power and influence. So this is the other side of things when people try to overpower you and get you to do things. Uh, maybe you don't want to do those things. So we have first negotiation. This is your attempt to accommodate what they want while also not giving in completely. So it gives you some of the power back. You have non-negotiation where you resist compliance without any attempt to compromise and you just refuse to do what they ask. Justification is when we resist compliance by giving reasons why we shouldn't do what they're asking. We have what's called identity management. This is where you manipulate the image of the person making the request. Uh, negative identity management uh, is where you might portray what they're asking is unreasonable or unfair. And positive identity management is where you just dismiss it and... Uh, Basically, try to make them feel good about themselves. So if it's someone trying to get you to do something for them because they don't feel they're adequately prepared, you turn and say, no, you've got this. Uh, you have a lot more experience with it than I do anyway. There's a lot of impact on our power with and over other people by minor changes that we can make. We can make ourselves more or less powerful by our word choices, by the way we stand or sit or make eye contact. So these are all very important things for us to learn.